Welcome once again. In this video, we are studying the book of James. It is going to be awesome. If you didn't see the previous video, Introduction to James, please go back and watch it because this whole entire video is building upon what we said in that video. Quick overview. We're going to be talking about temptations. We're going to be talking about seeing versus doing, faith versus works, the power of the tongue, healing, the power of prayer, the power of words. James chapter 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into various temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For that man shouldn't think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his high position, and let the rich in that he is made humble." Because like the flower in the grass, he will pass away. For the sun arises with the scorching wind and withers the grass, and the flower in it falls, and the beauty of its appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is a person who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord promised to those who love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then the lust, when it has conceived, bears sin. The sin, when it is full grown, produces death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom can be no variation nor turning shadow. When James said there is no turning shadow, it alludes to the sundial as the shadow changes and turns with time. God doesn't do that. Of his own will, he gave birth to us by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brothers, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Sounds a lot like the Proverbs, doesn't it? For the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, receive with humility the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Notice James here puts emphasis on doing. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deluding your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his natural face in a mirror. For he sees himself and goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of freedom and continues, not being a hearer who forgets, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks himself to be religious while he doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This man's religion is worthless. Pure religion and undefiled before our God and Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That is a tall order, isn't it? To keep yourself unstained by the world. There are many ways you can be stained by the world, by letting filthiness come into your eyes, into your ears, watching TV or other videos and, and other kinds of media, by listening to certain kinds of music that really isn't godly music. Chapter 2. My brothers, don't hold the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with partiality. For if a man with a gold ring in fine clothing comes into your synagogue, and a poor man in filthy clothing also comes in, and you pay special attention to him who wears the fine clothing and say, sit here in a good place, and you tell the poor man, stand there, or sit by my footstool. Haven't you shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? 
Listen, my beloved brothers, didn't God choose those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Don't the rich oppress you and personally drag you before the courts? Don't they blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? However, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Notice James here quotes the law of God, the Torah, and he says, if you do this, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin, being convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as men who are to be judged by the law of freedom. So this is a very overused and abused portion of scripture amongst many evangelical Christians today. That if you just stumble in one part of the law, you're guilty of it all. And what they're saying is, you just might as well just give up on doing any of it. And that is the opposite to what James is saying here. James here is encouraging everybody to do the law, to obey. You see, the modern day corrupt version of translating this is built upon a faulty premises. And that is that no one can obey the law. God is not an unreasonable tyrant to bark out commands to his beloved people whom he knows supposedly cannot obey all of his commands, and then attach a huge and very serious curse upon everybody who does not completely follow his law. The truth of the matter is, according to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and 1 John chapter 5 verse 3, his commands are easy to follow. A lot of Christians today, they say you got to obey all 613 commands. And if you break one of those 613 commands, you're guilty of breaking them all. So therefore, don't even try. Just kind of go by your feelings, which is going by the spirit according to them, which many times actually goes against God's word. And quite honestly, everybody's got their own version of what the spirit tells them to do. We got to base it upon the scriptures. The fact of the matter is, yes, according to the traditional Jewish way of interpreting the Torah, there are 613 commands in the Torah. However, most of those commands are not for the common man. Most of those commands are only for priests. Some are only for men. God wouldn't require a common woman to obey a priest's commands. Some commands are only for children. Some commands are only for the strangers in the land those who are visiting you. The laws of God that he wants you to obey are simply the laws that you can obey. And they are certainly far less than 613 and they are easy to obey. This is why James mirrors the precept that we read about in Psalm chapter 119. And that is that the Torah is the law of freedom. That's why James says here, so speak and so do as men who are to be judged by the law of freedom. What is the law of freedom? It's the exact law that he just quoted here. He didn't say it's a different law. The law of God is the law of freedom. You shall love your neighbor as yourself is the law of freedom. Do not commit adultery. That's the law of freedom from adultery. Do not commit murder. That is freedom to obey that. And many Christians over translate this. What I mean by that is they take what James says here and they read into it what it doesn't say. They say that, you know, if you break one law, it's as bad as you breaking another law. And that is not exactly what James is talking about here. James is talking about generics. You claim to be an, a Torah observer. You're, you claim to go by the word of God. You claim to go by the Torah of God. Will you break it over here? You're a lawbreaker. You're a Torah breaker. Does that mean that every commandment is equal to another? Of course not. We read in the scriptures how different commandments have got different penalties. Some penalties are very, very small, such as like paying a fine. Other penalties are pretty serious, such as death, okay? So there are greater commandments, as Jesus says, and there are lesser commandments. There are greater sins, as Jesus said, and there are lesser sins. 
So don't over translate this. Don't take this out of context. Different commands are on different levels. Verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to him who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Goes along with what Jesus said, if you forgive others, the Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, God will hand you over to the tormentors. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if a man says he has faith but has no works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and in lack of daily food and one of you tells him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, yet you didn't give him any of the things the body needs, what good is it? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead in itself. Dead faith will not get you an inch toward heaven. Yes, a man will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. One time I was talking to a friend of mine who is now a pastor. And I said to him, a lot of Christians, they, they say they're Christians. They believe they're Christians because they read the Bible, they pray, they believe that Jesus came, they believe that Jesus died on the cross, they believe that Jesus rose from the dead, they go to church. But you know, according to the scriptures, Satan knows the Bible, Satan prays. He had several dialogues with God in the scripture. It also says that he stands before the throne of God day and night accusing the brothers. Therefore, he's always praying. And believe it or not, the devil goes to church too. And the devil knows that Jesus came. The devil knows that Jesus died on the cross. The devil knows that Jesus rose from the dead. So what makes you different than the devil? I said that to that friend of mine and he was like, well, I gotta preach that. Just because you read your Bible, just because you pray, just because you go to church, just because you believe, does not mean that you're any better than the devil. Doesn't even mean you're a Christian. What counts is repentance. If God so has grace upon you, so has mercy upon you, that he gives you the gift of repentance, the power to turn from sin, the power to be free from that sin, that is something the devil will never have. But do you want to know, vain man, that faith apart from works is dead? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in that he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? Now this and this whole passage goes against what a lot of people believe what Paul said. In, in fact, it does go against what Paul said. And some people believe that James wrote his letter in rebuttal to Paul's letters. And as I said in the introduction video, James has way more authority than Paul. Therefore, if you discern a contradiction here, James wins. Verse 22, you see that faith worked with his works, and by works faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. You see, Paul quoted that in a totally different tone, but James here adds context. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And this here, this right here is gold. You see then that by works, a man is justified and not only by faith. Woo, I tell you some of those evangelical Christians, their hair is standing up right now and they're trying to dance around that. They're trying to ignore that. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. No, no yeah, buts. It's what James says. And James has the authority to say it. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, even so, faith apart from works is dead. James chapter 3. Let not many of you be teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a heavier judgment. For we all stumble in many things. Anyone who doesn't stumble in word is a perfect person, able to bridle the whole body also. Indeed, we put bits into the horse's mouths so that they may obey us. And we guide their whole body. Behold, the ships also, though they are so big and are driven by fierce winds, 
are yet guided by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. So the tongue is also a little member and boasts great things. See how a small fire can spread to a large forest? And the tongue is a fire. The world of iniquity among our members is the tongue, which defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by Gehenna, or hell. For every kind of animal, bird, creeping thing, and sea creature is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but nobody can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the image of God. Out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send out from the same opening fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, yield olives or vine figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good conduct that his deeds are done in gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and don't lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition are, there is confusion and every evil deed. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James chapter 4. Where do wars and fightings among you come from? Don't they come from your pleasures that war in your members? You lust and don't have. You murder and covet and can't obtain. You fight and make war. You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? This is where a lot of people miss it. They say, oh, we got to love the world. We got to love everybody. We got we to be friends with everybody. That is totally against the will of God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who lives in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore it says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Be subject, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. One time a friend of mine says, you know, it says God resists the proud. He said, you know that word resists? It means that God sets himself up in battle array against the proud. I never forgot that, but I never really tested that. I never really checked it out for myself until years later. And it, it's true. Where it says God resists, it actually means that God sets himself up in battle array against the proud. You better make sure you're humble. No pride allowed. Be subject, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Don't speak against one another, brothers. He who speaks against a brother and judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Again, notice here that James puts an emphasis on doing the law. Only one is the lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, let's go into this city and spend a year there, trade and make a profit. Yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. For what is your life? For you are a vapor, like a puff of steam, that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will both live and do this or that. But now you glory in your boasting. All such boasting is evil. To him, therefore, who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. James chapter 5. 
Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming on you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be for a testimony against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up your treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud. Cry out! And the cries of those who reaped have entered into the ears of the Lord of armies. You have lived in luxury on the earth. You have taken your pleasure. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and you have murdered the righteous one. He doesn't resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient over it, until it receives the early and late rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Don't grumble, brothers, against one another, so that you won't be judged. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Take, brothers, for an example of suffering and of perseverance, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we call them blessed who endured. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the Lord in the outcome and how the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. But above all things, my brothers, don't swear, not by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you don't fall into hypocrisy. Pretty much what Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the assembly and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will heal him who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The insistent prayer of a righteous person is powerfully effective. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't rain on the earth for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. As always, seek the Lord with all your heart, and if you do, you will find him. Call upon him, and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.